Morning all, morning to orange cutters, morning to yoghurt gobblers, welcome to the reading on transgression by Roger Bataille, excuse me, by Georges Bataille. Um, today uh, I'm reading from the his book uh, Eroticism, here, here we go. And before we get started, I would like to read uh, three sentences just to place us in the world of transgression, war and taboo that uh, Georges Bataille describes. And although he, he writes rather beautifully, um, there are certain parts that are really quite tricky. So on the subject of transgression, I'm going to just read these three little clips first. And then we'll read the whole chapter of transgression from eroticism. The frequency and the regularity of transgressions do not affect the intangible stability of the prohibition since they are its expected complement. Just as the diastolic movement completes a systolic one or just as an explosion follows upon a compression. That's the first one. The second one is this. The sacred world depends on limited acts of transgression. It is the world of celebrations, sovereign rulers and God. So the sacred world depends on limited acts of transgression. Okay, final one. Religion is like a dance where a movement backwards is followed by a spring forward. Religion is like a dance where a movement backwards is followed by a spring forward. So transgression, taboo are a necessary component. They are there to be broken, but they're very much not there not to be broken as well. They are part of the essential rhythm of social, mystical, social religious life. What is curious to me is we're now entering the area of Bataille talking about collected spirituality which is exactly religion religion is collected spirituality so it includes mysticism which is maybe a direct connection with transcendence but it's it's quite refreshing to take a step forward into the collective when we're talking about spirituality chapter five transgression the transgression does not deny the taboo, but tr transcends it and completes it. It is not only the great variety of their subjects, but also a certain illogicality that makes it difficult to discuss taboos. Two diametrically opposed views are always possible on any subject. There exists no prohibition that cannot be transgressed. Often the transgression is permitted, often it is even prescribed. So that's with an E, prescribed to, uh, to order, like a doctor prescribes an order, not proscribed. We feel like laughing when we consider the solemn commandment, thou shalt not kill, followed by a blessing on armies and the te deum of the apotheosis. No beating around the bush, murder is connived at immediately after being banned. The violence of war certainly betrays the God of the New Testament, but it does not oppose the God of armies of the Old Testament in the same way. If the prohibition were a reasonable one, it would mean that wars would be forbidden and we should be confronted with a choice to ban war and to do everything possible to abolish military assassination or else to fight and to accept the law as hypocritical. But the taboos on which the world of reason is founded are not rational for all that. To begin with, a calm opposite to violence would not suffice to draw a clear line between the two worlds. If the opposition did not itself draw upon violence in some way, if some violent negative emotion did not make violence horrible for everyone, reason alone could not define these shifting limits authoritatively enough. Only unreasoning dread and terror could survive in the teeth of the forces let loose. This is the nature of, 
of the taboo which makes a world of calm reason possible but is itself basically a shudder appealing not to reason but to feeling just as violence is. Human violence is the result not of cold calculation but of emotional states, anger, fear or desire. We have to take into consideration the irrational nature of taboos <clears throat> of taboos if we want to understand the difference, the indifference to logic they constantly display. In the sphere of irrational behaviour, we are reviewing what we have to say. To quote, sometimes an intangible taboo is violated, but that does not mean to say that it has ceased to be intangible. We can even go as far to say that it has uh, we can even go as far to say as the absurd proposition the taboo is there in order to be violated so some bizarre part of society's law is condoning the 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 violation of a taboo or the the exercising of a taboo there's some implicit condoning of this how this is possible but i will try and explain the prop this proposition is not the wager it looks like, like at first, but an accurate statement of an inevitable connection between conflicting emotions. When a negative emotion has the upper hand, we must obey the taboo. When a positive emotion is in, is in the ascendant, we violate it. Such a violation will not deny or suppress the contrary emotions, but justify it and arouse it. We should not be frightened of violence in the same way if we did not know or at least obscurely sense that it could lead us to worse things. The statement, the taboo is there to be violated, ought to make sense of the fact that the, the taboo on murder, universal though it may seem, nowhere opposes war. Nowhere opposes war. I am even convinced that without the prohibition of war, uh, excuse me, I am even convinced that without the prohibition, war would be impossible and e inconceivable. Animals, recognising no taboos, have never pro progressed from the fights that, that from the fights they take part in to the organised undertaking of war. War in a way boils down to the collective organisation of aggressive, aggressive urges. Like work, it is organised by the community. Like work, it has a purpose. It is the answer to the considered intention of those who wage it. We cannot say, therefore, that war and violence are in conflict, but war is organised violence. The transgression of the taboo is not animal violence. It is violence still, used by a creature capable of reason, putting his knowledge to the service of violence for, this, for the time being. At the very least, the taboo is the threshold beyond which murder is possible, and for the community, war comes about when the threshold is crossed. If transgression proper, as opposed to ignorance of the taboo, did not have this limited character, it would be a return to violence, to animal violence, but nothing of the kind is so. Organised transgression, together with the taboo, makes social life what it is. I'll just repeat that. Organised transgression together with the taboo makes social life what it is. The frequency and the regularity of transgressions do not affect the intangible stability of the prohibition since they are its expected complement, just as the diastolic movement completes the systolic one or an explosion follows upon compression. The compression is not subservient to the explosion, far from it. It gives it increased force. This looks like a new idea, though it is founded on immemorial experience. But it runs counter to the world of speech from which science is derived, and that is why it is found stated only recently. And that is why it is found stated only recently. Marcel Mauss, perhaps the most remarkable interpreter of the history of religion, was conscious of it and formulated it in his oral teaching. But his printed work brings it out only in a small number of significant sentences. Only Roger Caillois, 
following Mao's teaching and advice, has fully examined this, this aspect of transgression in his theory of celebrations. Transgression without limits. Often the transgression of a taboo is no less subject to rules than the taboo itself. No liberty here. At such and such a time, and up to a certain point, this is permissible. That is what the transgression concedes. But once a limited license has been allowed, unlimited urges towards violence may break forth. The barriers are not merely raised, for it may even be necessary at the moment of transgression to assert their solidity. Concern over a rule is sometimes at its most acute when that rule is being broken, for it is harder to limit a disturbance already begun. However, in exceptional cases, unlimited transgression is conceivable. Let me give you a noteworthy instance. It can happen that violence overreaches the bounds of the taboo in some way. It seems, it may seem, that once the law has become powerless, there is nothing to keep violence firmly within the bounds, of the f bounds in the future. Basically, death contravenes the taboo against the violence which is supposedly its cause. Most frequently, the subsequent sense of rupture brings in its wake a minor disturbance which funeral rites and festivities with their ordered ritual setting bounds to or disorderly urges. Uh, this sentence is really tough. Let me start again. Most frequently, the subsequent sense of rupture brings in its wake a minor disturbance which funeral rites and festivities with their ordered ritual setting bounds to disorderly urges are able to absorb, are able to absorb. But if death prevails over a sovereign whose exalted position might seem to be a guarantee against it, that sense of rupture gets the upper hand and disorder knows no bounds. Kaiwa has described the behavior of certain oceanic peoples. Quote, When social and natural life, he says, are summed up in the sacred person of a king, the hour of his death determines the critical instant and lo loses ritual license, or loses ritual license. This license corresponds closely with the importance of the catastrophe. This sacrilege, this sacrilege has a social nature. It is committed at the expense of the kingship. It is committed at the expense of the kingship, the hierarchy, and the frenzy of the people. This is considered as necessary as obedience to the dead man was. Um, I think it should be as the dead man was. That might be a typo. In the Sandwich Islands, the people on learning of the king's death commit all the acts looked on as criminal in ordinary times. <coughs> they set buildings on fire they loot and they murder, while women are expected to prostitute themselves publicly. In the Fiji Islands, the consequences are even more clearly defined. The death of the chief gives the signal for pillage. Subject tribes invade the capital and indulge in every form of brigandage and depredation. Yet, these transgressions still constitute a sacrilege. They break the rules that were in force yesterday and which will be restored tomorrow, sacred and inviolable. They appear, in fact, as major acts of sacrilege. It is noteworthy that the disorder takes place during the critical period of decay and de degradation represented by death during the time when its active and contagious virulence is in full swing. It ends when all the rotting flesh has finally disappeared from the royal corpse, when nothing is left of the remains but a hard, clean, incorruptible skeleton. End quote. The mechanism of transgression is manifest when violence is let loose in this way. 
Man intended to curb nature when he set up taboos in opposition, and indeed he thought he had succeeded. When he confined the violent urges of his own nature within bounds, he thought he had done the same for violence in the world outside himself. But when he saw how ineffectual was the barrier he had sought to set up the violence, the setup against violence, the rules he had meant to observe himself, lost their significance. His suppressed urges were unleashed, thenceforth he killed without hesitation, ceased to control his sex sexual exuberance, and feared no longer the, to, public, to perform publicly and unrestrainedly acts which hitherto he had only performed in private. As long as the king's body was given over to an active decomposition, the whole of society was under the sway of violence. The barrier that had not saved the king from the ravages of death could not withstand the excesses that constantly endanger the social order. No well-defined rules ordered these major acts of sacrilege given free reign by the death of the king, but when nothing remains of the dead man but the clean bones, this chaotic reign of license comes to an end. Even in this extreme case, transgression has nothing to do with the primal liberty of animal life. It opens the door into what lies beyond the limits usually observed, but it maintains these limits just the same. Transgression is complementary to the profane world, exceeding its limits but not destroying it. Human society is not only a, a world of work, simultaneously or successively, it is made up of the profane and the sacred, its two complementary forms. The profane world is a world of taboos. The sacred world depends on limited acts of transgression. It is the world of celebrations, sovereign rulers and God. This approach is a difficult one, in that the sacred simultaneously has two contradictory meanings. The sacred has two contradictory meanings simultaneously. Whatever is the subject of a prohibition is basically excuse me. Whatever is the subject of a pro prohibition is basically sacred. The taboo gives a negative definition of the sacred object and inspires us with or on the religious plane. That's a fantastic sentence. Um, the taboo gives a negative definition of the sacred object and inspires us with or on the religious plane. Carried to extremes, that feeling becomes one of devotion and adoration. The gods who incarnate this sacred essence put fear into the hearts of those who reverence them. Yet men do reverence them nonetheless. Men are swayed by two simultaneous emotions. They are driven away by terror and drawn by an awed fascination. Taboo and transgression reflect these two contradictory urges. The taboo would forbid the transgression, but the fascination compels it. Taboos and the divine are opposed to each other in one sense only, for the sacred aspect of the taboo is what draws men towards it and transfigures the original interdiction. The often intertwined themes of mythology spring from these factors. The only clear and comprehensible distinction between these two aspects of the taboo is an economic one. Taboos are there to make work possible, work is productive. During the profane period allotted to work, consumption is reduced to the minimum consistent with, with, to the minimum consistent with con continued production. Sacred days, though, are feast days. Then things which usually are forbidden are permitted or even required, though the upheaval is not necessarily as total as that following the death of a king. The values of the work workaday world are inverted, as Kaiwa has pointed out. From an economic standpoint, the reserves accumulated during periods of work are squandered extravagantly at feast times. Here is a clear-cut distinction. We are not perhaps justified in asserting that religion is based on breaking the rules rather than on the rules themselves, but feast days 
depend on a readiness to make great inroads upon savings, and feast days are the crown of religious activity. Getting and spending are the two phases of this activity. Seen in this light, religion is like a dance, where a movement, where a movement backwards is followed by a spring forward. A Bataille earlier mentioned diastolic and systolic movement, um, which is, for me, a beautiful uh, metaphor or image for this. Uh, the diastolic and systolic movement is the movement, uh, I, I'm sure, in many things, but in, in, in intestines of compression and release, allowing things to move along. I might be mistaken, but I think, uh, I think snakes might move like this. have to check it out. Man must combat his natural impulses to violence. This signifies an acceptance of violence at the deepest level, not an abrupt break with it. The feeling responsible for the rejection of violence is kept going in the background by this acceptance. Moreover, the urge to reject violence is so persistent that the swing of accepted violence excuse me, always has a dizzying effect. Really love this. It's, it's, Discussion of fascination, his fascination with taboo and dizziness and nausea of life. So again, moreover, the urge to reject violence is so persistent that the swing of accepted violence always has a dizzying effect. Man is seized first with nausea and then as it, is, as it passes by a heady vertigo phases of the paradoxical dance ordained by religious attitudes. That's so beautiful. I have to read it all again. You can't stop me. Moreover, the urge to reject violence is so persistent that the swing of accepted violence always has a dizzying effect. Man is seized first with nausea, then as it passes by a heady vertigo, phases of the paradoxical dance ordained by religious attitudes. attitudes. So we're almost there. Thanks for coping with my constant repetitions and stumblings. It's early morning and I haven't spoken before starting this reading, so uh, I should do more diaphragm exercises perhaps, but let's keep going. By and large then, in spite of the complexity of the impulses concerned, the, concerned, the meaning is plain enough. In spite of the complexity of the impulses concerned, the meaning is plain enough. Religion is the moving force behind the breaking of taboos. It's religion's responsibility. It's actually religion enforcing and condoning the taboos and the transgressions, just like the part of the Bible mentioned uh, by Bataille in the beginning. Thou shalt not kill, then a te deum, then the apotheosis, the exaltation of collective violence in war, directly after the thou shalt not kill commandment. Religion is founded on feelings of terror and awe. Indeed, it can hardly be thought of without them, and their existence causes some confusion. The recoil that inevitably follows the forward movement is constantly, be constantly being presented as the essence of religion. This interpretation is obviously incomplete and the misunderstanding could easily be cleared up but for a misleading inner swing or feeling based on a deep inversion in harmony with the rational or practical world. In universal religions like Christianity or Buddhism, terror and nausea are a prelude to bursts of burning spiritual activity. Founded as it is on a reaffirmation of the primary taboos, this spiritual life yet implies a, celebra a celebration, that is, the transgression, not the observation of the law. In Christianity and Buddhism, ecstasy begins where horror is sloughed off, or sloughed off. Ecstasy begins where horror is cut off. A sense of union with the irresistible powers that bear all things before them is frequently more acute in those religions where the pangs of terror and nausea are, are felt most deeply. More than any other state of mind, consciousness of the world about us throws us into exaltation. More than any other state of mind, consciousness of the void about us throws us into exaltation. 
This does not mean that we feel an emptiness in ourselves, far from it, but we pass beyond that into an awareness of the act of transgression. Thanks very much, folks. See you at 4 p.m.